And nobody ever goes back in after we throw it out. It's very, I don't think I've heard. I've never heard of it, I, neither have I. Maybe like one person I know that ever I got never, back in. I never heard of them letting them back in after they got thrown out. Yeah, right. This is going to hurt. It's time, it's time for, the for the Suffering Podcast. 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 And I'm like, really? <laughs> the one place I go is a dry county. So we had to go to Louisville in order to get drunk on Family Day weekend. What did you drink, Goldschlager? I don't even remember. Whatever it was, I just drank that. whatever it was. I remember it had the, the gold cheapest. flakes in it. We were drinking like Meister, bro. It was just <laughs> that bad. No, when just... we were in college, we were drinking Bush beer. It was eight dollars and sixteen cents a case. Rheingold, yeah. Rheingold, which Pabst was Blue the Ribbons. Most Pabst Blue Ribbons is now a premium PBRs, beer. Yeah, that's a premium beer. PBRs, but it was just whatever rot gut we could get at that particular time. Yeah. Ro- Rolling Rock. Is there any one incident in in in? Basic or shortly after Basic that stands out. You were stationed at Fort Knox. Yeah, um, and I wrote it about it in my book. Is in 1986 is when I got cured of racism. <laughs> okay, you have to go out in a little bit more depth than that one. <laughs> got cured. I got cured of it because my roommate, the gentleman who's from Alabama, like six foot five, two sixty. That's enough to cure you. Yeah, yeah. and um, <laughs> and he was razzing me because I was a shit bag, obviously, and and I called him the N word. Ooh, and he looked at me, and he's like, "Hard R, though, right? Not oh, the, not the A, not the A. Oh, oh we, yeah, it was hard." And he goes, uh, "I know you didn't just say that to me, did you?" I'm like, "Yeah, you want me to repeat it?" And I did. And he's like, "All right, come with me." So we locked the room. He locked the door. Literally beat my ass for like two hours. And then he sat me down, popped open a beer with me, and then he told me about how his grandparents marched with Martha Luther King. You know, March, what it was like going up, growing up as a, uh, somebody from family sharecroppers. So you you being from the north and him being from Alabama where they saw it yeah. firsthand. Firsthand. They have a lot different perspective. And yeah. I know this because of Chris Anderson. So yeah. Chris Anderson's from Alabama. Yeah. And they're, they're, it's still skewed down there. Mm-hmm. Like it's still, it's still unacceptable for a black man to be seen with a white woman. Yeah. yeah. Which South, is crazy. South Carolina too. Same, which is crazy. Thing. Because it's 2024, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, let's get over. It. We're not fighting the Civil War no more. But well, now, they are down there still. But like from Virginia yeah. on south, they're still. But still we're fighting friends the Civil to War. this day, me and him. Yeah. And when we after we got together, and then we had another friend that I, I ruined with, and he was from Compton, California. We would walk through the motor pool. I would call him Porch Monkey. He would call me Cracker, because we were best friends. Yeah. And people were like, "What?" Did I just hear that? And like we were be in my room, and and I'd be bumping N.W.A., Tupac, Biggie, because I after that I never saw a color. It was just people were just people, and I still don't see it to this day. Well, I, I just people are just people. I so I have this argument with my son. He likes rap, okay, but what he listens to is not rap. So I don't see color. I see shitty music. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to, we, we were in Lancaster, Pennsylvania over the weekend, so it's a two and a half hour drive back, and, and we're going through songs. I'm like, no, this is, because uh, I am a fan of, so, of, of like 80s rap and, yeah. and maybe early 90s stuff. Sugar Hill Gang. Sugar Hill Gang, uh, LL Cool J, Cool Mo D, you know, all those things. Tone and, Loke. Tone, and I'm playing them these things. Yeah, you weren't playing any gangster rap. No. That was just all well, mainstream. You know, California Love, We I, I played in California Love by Pop. Tupac, and, uh, but... We're, I'm playing these things. I'm like, this is, see, there's a difference because it's got, there's a beat to it and they're able to stay with the beat. These guys are real musicians. This shit that you're listening to, it's all auto tuned. You can tell it's auto tuned. It, there's no beat. Every other word is bitch or motherfucker or the N word. And I'm like, I, I just don't, there's nothing, there's no reason for that stuff. It's just gratuitous language in there. There's no musician. It's like they're pushing. Pushing the envelope to see what they can get away with. Yeah, that's over. You know, there's really no story no. to a lot of those songs. Yeah. You know, you listen to, uh, you know, Mama Said Knock You Out by LL Cool J. All right, there's a beat to it. There's something you can you can bob your head to it. I'm listening to this stuff. I'm like, it's freaking horrible. So yeah. I don't see color. I see shitty music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Man, but like I said, even when I work out, I mean, I still listen. To, I still got DMX. I still listen to Pac. I still listen to. But I'm 55 year old guy, so when I'm walking, I'm in the gym and I'm and I'm mouthing the words of DMX, and people are looking at me like, 
not supposed to say that. I'm like, I bought the album. I can say what I want to say. <laughs> you, you got your pass as soon as you paid that money. Exactly. <laughs> but that's kind of cool, though. So the you went into the Army with, with one mindset, yeah. this mindset of, of being from the North. And it's, and it's odd because being from the North, we're around everybody. You know, there's there. It's just a, a huge melting pot. Yeah, when you're from pot. Nutley, no, it's, you're not, mostly, not, not Nutley it's mostly all Italians. Yeah, exactly. Italians yeah. And, and Polish people. <clears throat> so there, there's not all. It, it used to be. It's. I mean, it's still there. Are a lot of people are moving up from Newark and Belleville, but it used to be straight white in in, in, uh, in Nutley. In if Nutley. you weren't Italian, you were a minority. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I just. You know, you, you go down south and you, you see people's views and you see the, their differences of opinion. And I just never get it. I never understand it because I guess it's from where I'm from. Yeah. And yeah. and how you're raised. Like, I, I say it all the oh, time. I was I'm raised like, in an incredibly racist household. But I'm, I'm, I say it all the time. To me, racism is a learned behavior. It is. You can take a white kid, a black kid, a Hispanic kid, Asian kid, put them on a playground and they're going to play all day. I remember I got the shit knocked out of me once because I said Willie Mays is a good baseball player. <laughs> I swear to God. You know, you see that that catch, that over-the-shoulder oh, catch. Yeah. Um, they say, hey, kid, Willie yeah, Mays. Yeah. Yeah. So he comes over the shoulder. I'm like, wow, he's a great baseball player. And I was not very popular in my house. The key component to any law enforcement officer being the best version of themselves is through education. Sherry Alsop is a leader in providing that education to police agencies, preparing them for the all too frequent dealings with sexual assault victims. You've seen Sherry on episode 169 of the Suffering Podcast. She survived incest and almost daily sexual assault, so she comes from a place of experience and true understanding. Sherry has the intelligence, commitment, and compassion to open the eyes of those on the front lines while providing the tools to effectively deal with a difficult situation. Sherry's instruction comes from experience and multiple certifications. Training with Sherry will offer on-site training, customized schedules, specialized instruction, tailored from a victim's perspective. You are going to hear Sherry's heart-wrenching but inspiring survivor story. Learn proprietary trauma-informed training techniques, uncovered victim-centered interview methods while earning continuing education credits according to your state guidelines. To be the best, you must learn from the best. Let Sherry also guide you through the delicate cases of sexual assault from a victim's point of view. Be a source of comfort to those victims affected by these traumatic experiences while producing a solid investigation and uncovering details that often go unnoticed. To find out more or to contact Sherry Alsop, go to SherryAlsop.com. That's S-H-E-R-R-I-E-A-L-L-S-U-P.com. But, you know, as I went to college and I got out of that environment, I started to see the hypocrisy in it. And after this guy knocked the shit out of you for two hours, yeah. did you finally see the hypocrisy in racism? Yeah, that's why I said I was cured from that day on. Because then I'm like, all right, you know, let me, because I like to do, I like to read. And like, I was, I had, I just did an interview with some lady and she was like, well, have you ever read the Quran? And I'm like, actually, yes, I have read the Quran. I've read the Quran. You know, so. And I've studied, you know. I love to study. I'll watch a documentary being made about a documentary. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, let me see where this guy's coming from. And then when I got older and I became homeless and, and a, a colored family brought me in and I lived with them for two years, that's when I realized the matriarch, the patriarch, where it all came from. So for me, I have a different perspective because a lot of people don't exactly live with a colored family for a couple of years. So the funny thing is, is you're in the military and it doesn't sound like you're fitting real well, all right? Not at all. So you said you were in a break eight times? Yeah, eight eight times. Yeah. What what did, what did you get caught for? Drinking and driving, uh, drugs, uh, missing a four star general's funeral on a funeral detail, uh, public drunkenness. I wound. I was in uh, Austin, Texas, and I wound up in Dallas, four hours away. No driver's license. Just some chick brought me there. <laughs> All right, let's go. Sounds like it sounds like a plan. Yeah. So for me, I just got in a lot of trouble. But what saved me is I was that guy that you put me in the field. I'm the man you want. So you were. A, I was the field dog. You you were a battle soldier. Oh yeah, I was the I was the guy. You want me to step seventy two hours? Good. Let's slam some red bulls. We're good. I'm, I'm ready to roll. But you bring me in the garrison. You put me in the rear with the gear, I'm in trouble. So Jesse Ventura says that. So Jesse Ventura says, I was a great wartime soldier. Yeah. I was a horrible peacetime soldier. And that's exactly how I, I would. I was so, my, first, my first iteration. My second iteration, 
I started out again as a shit bag, and then I went from worst to first. So, so how after eight times in 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 military jail, the break, how did they come to you and say, "Hey, maybe this isn't for you"? Well, after I got busted the last time, and they're like, uh, "You know, we're, I'm your uncle, and you, I don't want you to be my nephew anymore. So you got to go. Your plane leaves on Monday." Oh, they just threw you out. No, they're like, "You're you're done." So I got a under honorable condition. So it wasn't an honorable condition. So you wait. So it's not dishonorable. I know no, it was m- under honorable, which means um, it can upgrade in like six months if you if you push for it. But I'm like, fuck, am I going to push for? You never. You at this point, you figure you're never coming back. I, mean, I ain't coming back. You just threw me out. <laughs> I ain't coming back. And nobody ever goes back in after me thrown out. It's very. I don't think I've heard. I've never heard of it. I, neither have I. Maybe like one person I know that ever I got never, back in. I never heard of them letting them back in after they got thrown out. Yeah, right. It's like you get thrown out of the police academy and you're not going to say, eh, come back yeah, in come two back weeks in. later. Well, that actually happens now. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Oh, believe me, I know. From the time you left the military until your re-enlistment, what, what, what was your life like? Did you come back to New Jersey? Oh, yeah, I came back and I, I lived on St. Mary's Place in Belleville. It was, it was right on the street from Belleville and Nutley over by the Pathmark. It used to be Pathmark. Um, and I went to live with that mom and dad, but, you know, I'm, I just partied for two years Should have stayed at around the, the whole world. Should have stayed at the Washington Motel. <laughs> and they're like, uh, you know. Belleville, mom, Belleville like, Motor Lodge. Yeah. <laughs> you check in, but you, you take by the hour. The BML. But, you know, my dad came off the boat from Italy. Didn't speak the language. But he worked his ass off two jobs, bought two houses cash, side hustle. So, you know, I got home at 19. He's like, you got to be in by 10. What do you mean? I just party with Joe Jedge. <laughs> you want me to be in bed by 10? He's like, yeah, I got to be up at 5. I got to support this family. I got I got two families to support. They're still drinking. No, well, yeah, but they, they partied on the weekends. So, okay. you know, and then dad's like, listen, if you can't go by my rules, you got to go. And I'm like, as a father now, I'm like, I get it. Yeah. I'm like, I, I understand. But he's like, if you can't go by my rules, you got to go. I lived in my truck for 18 months, and I lived in a crack house on, uh, in Nutley. I actually lived in, uh, they don't call it a crack house. It was a, one of the tenements where all the homeless people lived. And I lived there for, I was eating out of garbage cans and actually uh, eating uh, dented cans out of uh, ShopRite in Nutley. I used to go pick, up, pick out the garbage, you know, all the, all the food out of the garbage. Was it was it like a, a flop house or yeah. was it like a controlled? It was like a flop house. Yeah, yeah, and but squatters. It, yep, and it, and but my my attitude was so bad, I actually got thrown out of a crack house. <laughs> <laughs> so you know your attitude's bad when you get thrown out of a crack. House. So I'm starting to see a pattern here. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> okay, yeah, you think thrown out of high school, thrown out of the military, thrown, thrown out, out of, of a own, crack house, thrown out of yeah. your own house, thrown yeah, out of your thrown, own house, then and then thrown out of a crack house, then thrown out of a crack house. Yeah, so, you, so you see something. Yeah, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Think he's going to get thrown out of the studio tonight? <laughs> <laughs> that, I, that, I, that I hope not. I, I, I'll, I'll behave with my energy drink here. So. <laughs> I so, thought it was a white claw when I first walked in. Yeah, like, no. At any point in this time, did you figure, God, what am I doing to myself here? Because uh, I'm sure the pleasure is all gone from doing the drugs and the alcohol. Well, and for me, you know, and I'm 20, I'm 19 years old. I got no future, so I'm just surviving. You know, I'm just trying not to get sick. Was your body breaking down at all? No, um, I, I mean I was still strong as a bull. So that that I was still hitting the gym because my my cousin owned Gold's Gym down in Belleville, so I was still hitting the gym all the time. So, so you were able to look the part of a of a functioning, functioning member of alcoholic. society. Oh yeah, a functioning alcoholic also. Yeah, and I worked. And I worked full time. So that that that's like Charlie. So our friend Charlie Cifarelli, who was. Drugs, alcohol, but he was a gym guy. So he never looked like that. So nobody ever really paid attention. He wasn't one of these people sleeping on the street. He was homeless for a short period of time. But he, he just never looked apart. So he was able to squeak through. Yeah. And you, know? you and you and you know, and addicts and alcoholics, you can learn to play the system. You know, we're the we're the greatest salespeople yeah. in the world. So I you know, you, you, I can look perfectly fine. Even today, I can look fine here, but you know, like I, I put something on my social media page the other day. Imposter syndrome kicked my ass last week. Yeah. So I could be looking great here, but, you know, I get home sometimes and I'm like, you know, we all have that. We all have that. You That's know? because you you advocate for a certain lifestyle and what you do now. And, and, and I want to pass this off to you as well because I know I feel this. You advocate for a certain lifestyle and then there's certain things in your life that, is, that are a little jacked up. And then you start feeling well, like, 
I'm sitting here talking about this, but I'm not yeah, living exactly. it. And and you start getting really down on yourself. Well, it's the imposter syndrome. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, for me, you know, even coming here, I felt kind of weird because, you know, I'm, I'm still 60% blind. And having an Uber here and not being able to drive. And sometimes that imposter syndrome was like, who am I to be on their show? Or who am I to be interviewing David Meltzer or Robert Kiyosaki? You know, these people who are, you're just a, you're just a you know, a ninth grade dropout. And then, you know, some people would be like, Rich, you are the real deal. So for me, I, 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 and, and we all go through it. It just, I think it's the brave people that are willing to say, I struggle with it too. Yeah, I think, I think everybody struggles. I know I certainly struggle with it all the time. You know, it's, it's who the hell am I? Like, what, what are you talking, who the hell am I? I'm nobody. You know, Kevin, I go through that a lot with this show too. Yeah. Because we're not, you know, every day isn't, you know, sunshine and, rainbow, sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes you're having a bad day, and we got to come in here and talk to someone else about their bed. <laughs> well, how many times? So you you you, you see somebody come in this show, and 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 they're they're so excited, and they're like, "I can't believe I'm here and stuff." And you and I walk up to the studio, is like, "Okay, yeah, yeah, what's up, Mike? How you doing? How was your week?" Yeah, so <laughs> that's where the, I think that's where the imposter syndrome, where you see somebody else's reaction, but we have a we have our own little personal views of each other and ourselves. Yeah. And they don't fit. They're not in alignment with, say, somebody else might see us. Um, but you're so you're 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 kicked out of the crack house. How how so long... he got kicked out of a crack house? So he figured he'd rejoin the military. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> what what? That's I'm trying to find that segue yeah. into like. Well, I got nothing else. Let me see what I can do. Well, this is where I might get thrown out of the. This, I might get thrown out of the studio now. Uh, I actually robbed the police officer. Oh, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Not smart. Uh, no, it, that's it, not the smartest move. No, but no, it ballsy. Uh, but he owned a he owned a bar, and he asked me to bartend for him. <laughs> An alcoholic, you know, which is not smart. But I bartended for him on New Year's Eve in 1989, going into '89, and I was 20. And everything was going great until like eight hours later, he knock on the door. Three of his buddies coming to lock me up. I gave away like three thousand dollars worth of free drinks. Oof. And uh, you were pretty and, popular and, and that I, night. Oh yeah, and I had like five grand in my pocket. <laughs> and he told me, you know, he's like, "Listen, he, he came to lock me up. He's, he's like, you're 20 years old. Uh, you robbed a police officer. Let's just get that straight. So you're going to go to big boy jail for at least five years, and you're going to do all five. He's like, and you're going to be somebody's bitch because you're still good looking. He says you're going to be a white boy. You're going to jail. You're going to be somebody's bitch or you can give me my money back in 24 hours and you got to go to your first AA meeting tomorrow and you got to do 90 days in a row. That's a good cop. Yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, that guy yeah. was placed in your life for a reason. Mm -hmm. And there are certain, there are certain cops out there that are angels. And I don't care yeah. what anybody says they're placed in front of people for a reason. Yeah. And if I, if I remember, if I wish I could remember, I would take him out for the biggest lobster dinner, whatever you want. I got you. His last name was Donaldson. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're a little, you're a little bit light. I mean, you're not tanning as much as I, you. his I, partner was Felice, I think, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> we age backwards like Dick Clark, so keep going. So you know, I hit, I went to my first, I put, I begged and I borrowed. I didn't steal. I, I got the money back and I, I borrowed it and I paid it all back. Um, and I hit my first meeting at St. Mary's Place in Belleville, and and I in Nutley then the Church of St. Mary's Place. I was still drunk and hungover that morning. But he said to do 90 meetings. I hit 300 in a row, and I haven't had a drink since 1989. Mm, congratulations. So I, I quit at the age of 20. He didn't even make, so drink. I, he didn't even I, make drinking age. I didn't age. even make the drinking age. <laughs> and I haven't had a drink or even a, anything stronger than an aspirin for the last 35 years. But um, that, that police officer, you know, he's, I've always had angels around me. And he was just one of them that, that changed, changed my world. Can you imagine you run into a guy who's grizzled, who's been beaten down by the system? You would have probably done five five long years. Yeah. yeah. And he said, you're going to do five. Yeah. He said, especially if you robbed an officer, you're doing five. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and thrown out of the military. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you have a bad record already. You don't have a GED, so you're, and you're going to jail for five. So You, should, either, you, you need to Oprah that. You need to do an Oprah request on who that guy owned. Do you, you know what town it is, right? I, I don't even remember. Where, where were you bartending? It was with? in Newark, downtown Newark. Somewhere. It was in Newark. Was he a Newark cop? I think so. 
All right. You can find that information out because that right there, that guy deserves at least a pat on the back. Oh, he, he deserves more than that. He turned your life around. Yeah, he did. He turned your life around yeah. right there. Yeah. And and as police officers, that's really like that's the the brass ring for us. That's the honorable thing to do. It's that one you you reach that one person and you make an impact on their lives. Yeah. So, you know, I, I I encourage you to find that that person out and and I'll be willing I know Mike will be willing as well to give you any help that we can on that one. Yeah, because like I said, you know, he was one of my angels, and I've had a couple of angels in my life, and he's one of them. You know, he'll probably be in his 70s. Yeah. So bring yeah. him on the show. Yeah, God, yeah. yeah. I, mean, okay. dude, I mean, he 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 saved he saved my bacon literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're you're clean now. You're looking at things with new eyes. 